So the next talk is by Timothy Hanson, uh, the fourth black hole in Sagittarius A star. Okay, so let me start. So first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to, to talk. Um, today I'll talk about deformed uh, care solutions <clears throat> in, in scalar tensor theory, and uh, also mention a little bit uh, the link to observations of stars around Sagittarius A star, like was described in the previous talk. So what I'll present is based on two papers, one, one uh, project which we started last year. One of them on the more theoretical aspects was was um, put on the archive about a year ago. And then the second one um, was just accepted in parody recently. So it's work I did with uh, with Evgeny Babichev, Kestas Shamozis, and Mokta Right, so maybe at this point I don't need to <laughs> motivate the study of modified gravity anymore, but uh, Okay, as you all know, the, the care solution describes rotating black holes in GR, right? Um, and it's interesting to, especially now, uh, given the, the talk we just, uh, we just saw, it's interesting to construct uh, deformations of such, uh, of the care space time in order to uh, find signatures of, of modified gravity, which will allow to test GR. And the approach which is usually adopted um, in the literature is to, is to what I call ad hoc deformations in the sense that um, people usually just uh, mo modify metric components of the metric uh, in the maximal way that preserves some symmetry that they want to, to conserve, for instance. And uh, in this approach, you, you don't know the underlying theory um, of your solution. What we, what we propose, uh, propose is using the disformal map, you can actually construct um, deformed uh, versions of the care space time, which are actually solutions to, to higher order scalar tensor theories. And in the second half of the talk, I'll briefly describe the, the post Newtonian motion of, of stars um, around such uh, a deformed care black hole and sort of discuss the link with the, the current and future experiments regarding the galactic center. So, right, the first part will be more theoretical about the properties of these solutions, and then I'll, I'll study the orbit of stars. Okay, so let me start with um, one slide about the care solution, which will be our starting point. So this is the, va the vacuum solution in GR for a rotating object and uncharged. And what I've written is the, the care uh, line element in the Borel-Linquist coordinates, uh, which uh, the advantage of this coordinate system is that there's only one off diagonal term. Uh, it's the minimal amount. Kerr originally wrote it in another form, which is like the generalized uh, eddington finkelstein form. But th this form is nice for, for calculation purposes. And I've introduced the, the standard uh, functions. So rho squared is just r squared c squared cosine squared theta, and delta here is this polynomial of r. And I should mention m is the mass of the object, and a is the angular momentum per unit mass or spin of the object. Um, and uh, as you as you know, this when this delta vanishes, um, it looks like the metric is singular. But in fact, these are only coordinate singularities, and you can actually coordinate transform to to a system of coordinates where the only singularity, which is also a, a curvature singularity, lies at rho equals zero. So when the when r vanishes, but also the the angle has to be pi over two. And this is referred to as the ring singularity. So this is our starting point. And uh, so we start from the care solution, which I, which I call GK. And we perform a disformal transformation of this, of this uh, space time uh, with constant coefficients. So here D and Q0 are constants. And we disform along the gradient of the scalar field, uh, which is given by this expression. So when, when D is zero, uh, this is actually a stealth care solution that was constructed in, in degenerate higher order uh, scalar tensor theories or dosed. And um, this scalar field is not just anything. It actually defines a, a time like geodesic. Um, I mean, the gradient of the scalar defines a, a time like geodesic direction. And uh, it's, it's actually quite simple to see this. The, the norm of the scalar is just minus, it's just a constant, a negative constant. And if you differentiate this expression and use the fact that you can commute uh, covariant derivatives on a scalar field, 
you just get the geodesic equation for the vector uh, nabla mu phi. Okay. And uh, since the dose 20 class is stable under this formal map, so this was very well explained by uh, David Longo two talks ago, uh, we obtain another dose solution, which depends on generically on these parameters because uh, it depends on the, this formal parameter here, uh, of which uh, these two objects are solution. Okay, so we, we, can, we can exhibit the solution. Now I must say, because I'll, I'll get a question otherwise, that uh, since we're, we're disforming, um, this doesn't preserve the speed of gravitational waves. So in our in our theory, uh, CT won't be able to win. But we'll see that, uh, well, I mean, we still believe the, the study of these uh, objects are interesting uh, for other reasons, which which I'll, I'll mention. Oh, sorry, I forgot to say, if you're interested in more uh, details on the specific theories, uh, there was another paper um, which came out uh, on a similar uh, subject than ours and where they go into more details about, about the theory. Okay, so let's look at the, the explicit line element. Um, so this was obtained by doing the disformal transformation I just highlighted. And uh, we rescaled the mass here to this M tilde. And also rescaled the time coordinate like this so that the GTT component is exactly the same as care um, with a rescaled mass, okay? And what I put in red here is very important because uh, we'll see in the following that this can't actually be the, um, removed by a coordinate transformation and we'll uh, well I'll, I'll give more details in the following but basically it's not just uh it's not just a case of redefining the time coordinate and eliminating this cross term because very crucially here there's a row squared depends on the theta coordinate so if you try to just uh do a coordinate transformation of this form uh it just won't be a, a diffeomorphism uh, so let me mention that the scalar again defines a geodesic direction because under the disformal map um, the uh, the kinetic term is just rescaled by one plus d here, and uh, also so David mentioned this already, but let me repeat it. When a is zero, the original Schwarzschild solution is just mapped after a coordinate transformation to another Schwarzschild solution with a rescaled mass. So this was uh, highlighted uh, explicitly by David in the previous talk. So in the following, we'll assume that D is non-zero because otherwise we just have care. And we'll assume that A is also non-zero because otherwise we, we just get short chilled with another mass. So let's, uh, let's see uh, some of the properties. So the first thing we can do is, is calculate some curvature scalars. All right, and the first thing we note is that the solution is no longer Ricci flat. Okay, because the Ricci scalar doesn't vanish. Again, unless D or A is zero, but whatever. Just assume this isn't the case. And what these uh, curvature invariants hint at is that there's only one singularity at rho equals zero, just like here. So this isn't sufficient to claim uh, to claim that this is the case, but you can actually just change coordinates like this. Uh, this is exactly the, the coordinate change to bring the metric in the advanced, the generalized advanced uh, eddington finkelstein form, which is the, basically the, the way Kerr wrote it originally. And in this, in this, uh, in these coordinates, you can actually see that the metric, I didn't write it here, but you can see that the metric is regular along with the scalar field. So here the scalar field is explicitly, it's fine. And this actually um, implies a very nice feature of the space-time um, because this scalar field, which has an everywhere time-like gradient can be thought of as a global time function. And this means that uh, our space-times are stably causal, meaning they remain causal even under a small perturbation of the light cone. And this is especially interesting um, because in other, uh, what I call the ad hoc deformations of care, which I mentioned in the introduction, it's been shown in a few of these cases that um, they suffer from pathologies such as closed time like curves. Uh, so this just um, basically shields us from these pathologies. So they, the, the scalar field inherent to the construction uh, also brings some nice properties to the solution. Okay, so now let me let me talk about uh, something which uh, we think is very important about these <laughs> solutions. So um, we didn't introduce any time or phi dependence uh, to the to the line element to do this formal transformation because the scalar field we we disform along uh, depends on time and radial coordinate only. So the the, the vectors dt and d phi are still killing vectors uh, and they still commute. So this is what we call an axisymmetric space time. So this is fine. But now if you consider the, so just define the associated one forms to the killing fields, so xi t, xi phi. 
you can calculate this, this combination here. Um, and it's non-zero, okay? And uh, this means that the space-time is non-circular. In, 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 uh, for care, for instance, you get this equals zero and also the other, um, the analogous uh, equation where the exterior derivative acts on psi phi instead. But for us, it's only, it's, I mean, it's uh, sufficient to find that one is non-zero. And this means that in the general case, our space-time is non-circular. And it means that you can't write it in a coordinate system where uh, this symmetry is, is apparent. So this reflection. You can't, so remember for care in the bohr lindquist coordinates, the only cross term was dt d phi. So if you simultaneously um, invert time and the phi angle, the, the metric stays the same. In our case, uh, it's not. So this is a very nice, uh, I mean, interesting property, uh, which has an impact on the separability structure of the space time actually, uh, which was, so such things were studied in the end of the 70s. And um, the fact that we have a non-circular space-time um, means that we actually don't have uh, a killing tensor. So you may know that for the care metric, there's a hidden symmetry associated to a rank two uh, non-trivial tensor, killing tensor. Um, and this uh, actually allows to write the geodesic system as a first order system and makes the study of care geodesics much, uh, much more tractable. So in our case, we, we can, of course, uh, we have some constants of motion associated to dt and d phi, this stays the same, but there's not this additional constant coming from the killing tensor. So if you want to uh, study geodesics, you, you have to sort of integrate them numerically. And this was actually done by, by this group uh, last year, and they studied the, the shadows of this form uh, care metrics. Now let me, let me quickly uh, talk about the, the structure of the, of the space-time in such solu solutions. So, The, um, there is again an analogous uh, surface to the ergosphere in care, meaning that when the GTT component of the metric vanishes, the vector, the killing vector DT becomes space-like, and uh, you, you get a region of space-time where you can uh, you know, extract energy from the black hole. So th this, uh, this is uh, sort of analogous to care. But where it becomes different is uh, when you look at the limiting surface for stationary observers. So when you do this picture in for care, um, so stationary observers, by this, I probably should have written it, sorry, I mean uh, observers that have a motion along t and phi directions, okay? So they lie at r and theta constant. And these stop to exist, the time-like stationary observers stop to exist once uh, this, this uh, equation uh, is verified, okay? And for care, this is actually the equivalent to delta equals zero, which gives the inner and outer horizons. So for care, the stationary limit is also the event horizon. But in our case, we get something different. We get that it's a time-like hypersurface, which doesn't even lie at constant r. It's a, it's a theta-dependent profile. But the, more importantly, the fact that it's time-like means that it can't correspond to an event horizon. That's a very important uh, Point. And actually, many, uh, I mean, I've seen many times in the literature, this, this, is, uh, this point is confusing, and people just assume that the horizon lies here, but forget that um, when you solve for this, you've implicitly assumed that you're looking for constant R solutions to the horizon surface. Um, so there's an inconsistency here, but it's overlooked uh, uh, often. So, so this is um, a bit more subtle. Instead, if you want a horizon surface, it needs to be null course. And um, actually, you, you need to consider theta-dependent profiles. And the null surface, which is given by this uh, hypersurface, basically the constraint on the radial coordinate to be some function of theta, has to verify this equation. Now, you see clearly from here that for care, it's, it's, uh, it's actually, uh, you, you can assume that there's no theta-dependence. So just get rid of this term. And for care, d is zero. So you don't have this last term either. So for care, you say, I'm going to look for, I'm going to look for a, um, a horizon at constant R surfaces. And the result is you just have to solve this. And it has constant R solutions. So you're happy you found the horizons. But in our case, if you assume that there's no theta dependence, then you have to solve this equation. And you see that here there's theta dependence. And it's just that the initial hypothesis is inconsistent. So you have to solve this. It's complicated. And we only did it numerically. Um, and one of the open questions that we'd like to have an answer to is what happens between the stationary limit here, which for care uh, corresponds to the outer horizon, and the actual null surface, which lies uh, further inside. 
Um, one, one thing we I want to mention is uh, inside the, the stationary limit, the killing vectors are space-like, meaning that this horizon surface can't be a, a killing horizon, which is one major difference from GR and raises questions related to the thermodynamics of such objects. And um, here, the, actually, the, the rigidity theorem from Hawking breaks because, as you may remember, we're not in vacuum anymore. We don't have a, a Ricci flat space time. So, uh, however, asymptotically, um, the disformed metric is very close to care. So uh, the care metric with these parameters until A tilde can be written like this. This is standard. And after a coordinate transformation, which uh, I didn't write down, you can write the disformed metric like this. So it's basically care if you go far, far enough. And then you have these corrections, which come with this dependence in D. And uh, yeah, note in passing that when D becomes close to minus one here, uh, you may have influence, an influence of these terms uh, to leading orders. And we'll discuss this in the following. So basically by putting D close to one, minus one, you can uh, push these terms to, to lower orders in M over R. Um, and so the, the, main th the main takeaway from this, uh, from this slide is if you look at these objects from far away, you, you basically assume that you're looking at a care black hole with these masses and, and spin. Um, and you can actually actually show that it's also a sub-extremal care black hole. So from far away, you just think you, you have care. And then all these interesting things happen once you zoom in. And before moving on to the, to the orbit of stars, let me just uh, discuss some interesting limits. So as, as I, uh, I don't know if I said it, but the, the disformal parameter D has to lie in between minus one and plus infinity. Um, and we actually studied both of these limits. So we, we can start with the D equals, uh, D goes to infinity. And uh, we define here the dimension of spin in terms of the physical parameters. And after some coordinate transformation, you can actually write the metric like this. So when chi is zero, you just get Schwarzschild metric in, in Schwarzschild coordinates. But in general, you get this very non-trivial uh, thing here, and especially this dr d phi term, which breaks uh, circularity. Um, so we call this the uh, NCS metric, non-circular Schwarzschild, because just once you put the parameter to zero, you just get exactly Schwarzschild. And you can also isolate the scalar field and theories uh, corresponding to this. Um, but what's important is this provides an exact example, which is interesting, and is also non-circular, which is a non, which is not uh, common. And the other limit is what we called quasi vial because um, it looks like a biometric if you didn't have this cross term. And while this limit is uh, clearly singular because of these uh, rescalings by one plus D everywhere, if you put D to minus one, it blows up, but actually you can also make sense of it by some field redefinitions. And you can show that actually this, this line element plus this scalar field is solution to a particular dose one A theory that, that we wrote in, in the paper. And these two examples, uh, so I wrote, I wrote simpler and not simple because the, we still have many questions about these, but it still makes sense to start by understanding maybe these examples uh, before tackling the general case. Um, and they provide uh, interesting examples of non-circular space times, which are very, very rarely considered in the literature. I mean, almost never. Um, however, there are, uh, there are motivations to study these. They can arise in, in some physical situations with, uh, for instance, strong toroidal magnetic fields. And there have also been some numerical arguments that the circular ansatz may fail in the simulation of some black hole solutions. Um, so it's, it's, I mean, it seems like it's uh, sort of a neglected uh, uh, thing to study non-circular metrics. But of course, their study is, is much more difficult. So this is why we, we think these two simple, simpler examples are worth uh, studying. So let me, let me move to the post-Newtonian motion of stars around, uh, around the central black hole. Um, so the, the previous talk serves as a nice introduction to this, but basically we're going to assume that here in, in O, we have a deformed care black hole. So O is Sagittarius A star. And uh, we're going to study a, a star here, S, uh, which orbits around it. P here is the pericenter location. And um, we, we have all these angles, okay? Uh, in blue here is the line of nodes, which corresponds to the intersection of the uh, star's orbit with respect to this uh, plane, this reference plane in gray. We assume that the spin of the black hole is along the z-axis. And then you have, okay, you have these angles. So capital omega is called the nodal angle, lowercase omega is the pericenter angle, f is the true anomaly, and i, iota, is the inclination angle. And uh, you also have the eccentricity of the orbit, and you can basically look at the secular variation. So over uh, over 
few periods of the of these uh, parameters and uh, and see uh, how they're modified. So, for instance, the star S two, which was mentioned in the previous talk, has been observed observed for more than twenty five years, which allowed them to see more than one so a bit more than one period, and hence uh, already calculate the short field precession um, of this star, which is in accordance with GR, and also uh, about redshift, which was mentioned in the previous talk, which also agrees with GR. But in the future, for instance, when, when the stars with higher eccentricities and shorter orbital periods are, are measured, or when binary pulsars orbiting close to the black hole's hole are, uh, are observed, they'll be able to, to measure smaller effects, like the, the nodal angle uh, variation and also inclination, which come from a spinning black hole. Um, so for short you don't have this, but you do have it for care. And very importantly, it will provide a test of the, of the no-hair theorem. Okay, which states that the quadrupole moment is uniquely determined by the mass and, and uh, angular momentum. I mean, all the higher multiple moments, but this is the one that will be accessible the, the quickest, of course. So we study the, the PN motion of stars. So, all right, PN is just an expansion in, in the velocity squared over C squared, but for bound orbits, it's equivalent to um, uh, uh, an expansion in M over R, the mass over the, the distance to the black hole. And we use coordinates that are harmonic for the care metric, meaning that we verify this for the care solution. And we choose this so as to be able to easily compare to other works that have been done in this, um, in these coordinates. Um, and in particular, we very closely follow a paper by Will and Mitra from 2016. And what we'll do is we'll write the evolution equation, the Gauss uh, evolution equation for the orbital parameters up to 2 pn order. And use a two time scale analysis. So this um, this has to be used when you uh, when you want to have higher order higher pn order corrections. Um, you introduce another variable here, theta, uh, which is epsilon u. Epsilon is the bookkeeping parameter, and u is just the sum of the pericenter angle and the terminal mode. And um, basically, each orbital parameter, which is denoted by x k, so this is like uh, all these guys: omega, omega, yota, the eccentricity. They have this evolution equation, and uh, this system is just uh, a rewriting of Newton's uh, equations, basically, with a perturbed acceleration. So basically, you have to solve for these, and then you could decompose each of these parameters um, by a, a mean value uh, on the u parameter. So u varies on timescales much lower than theta. Okay, theta is smaller, so on the on the correct characteristic timescale of variation of u, capital theta can almost be taken uh, as a constant. But of course, the subtle here is almost. So at leading order, it can be taken as a constant. But once you're interested in higher PN corrections, it can't be taken as a constant. This is exactly what we do. And each, each of the orbital parameters are separated by an average value over u. So the, sorry, the, the angular brackets are uh, an average over the u, the u parameter. All right. Uh, and then you also add some uh, average three part, which will influence the higher order corrections. And from this, you, you obtain uh, the secular variation of each parameter. So here, the right-hand side doesn't depend on you anymore. And basically, to get the variation, you just uh, multiply the right-hand side by 2 pi, and you get it. Okay, so this is the formula we apply. And we do it in each of the, of the cases. So first, we start with the generic case, um, where d is not too close to, to minus 1, not too close to infinity, just some generic d. Uh, and we use also these two uh, parameters, which are, we just substitute eccentricity and pericenter angle for these alpha and beta. This is a standard. And we get these uh, secular variation for the, each of these. Uh, so this is at 2pn order, sorry. I should have probably put order of uh, like m cubed over r cubed or something, but up to order n squared, th this is the result. So if the red part is equal to one, this is just the care prediction. All right, so here you have the short field precession at leading order. You have the frame dragging effect coming from a spinning source. Here are uh, higher order corrections to the short field precession. And here you have the quadruple uh, contribution from care. So I, I, I remind you that chi here is the spin. So of course, for short field, you have neither frame dragging or the quadruple effect. But in our case, um, basically, the disformal parameter rescales the quadruple. Uh, here, chi squared. Um, and also here, you can see it. So basically, anywhere chi squared appears, uh, this is the quadruple moment. It's just rescaled by wind plus d. And everything uh, happens as though the quadruple moment is, is just rescaled, and it's different from care, importantly. 
So this means that generically the no-hair theorem is violated. Okay. And uh, we can also look at the other limits. So for instance, d goes to infinity. And as you may expect from this expression down here, sorry, uh, you can expect there to be no quadrupole moment. And uh, also from the name non-circular Schwarzschild, it's, it's very close to the Schwarzschild metric, but um, as you can see from these expressions, there is a frame dragging. So basically everything happens as in Schwarzschild where there's no quadruple term. You have just leading Schwarzschild and uh, subleading Schwarzschild here, but there's no quadruple. So it's kind of like Schwarzschild plus frame dragging if you want, okay. So this is interesting. And again, there's a violation of the noir. Uh, and also something is, which is uh, which I uh, find interesting is that even though the metric is non-circular at this order, um, at this PN order, the the averages that go on to, to obtain these expressions uh, don't put, don't um, there's no sign of the non-circularity of the metric on the circular variations. So I guess if we want at this order to see the effect of, of non-circularity, we have to look at um, more like instantaneous uh, orbits, or stuff like that, which we haven't done. But on on longer time scales. These non-circular effects just average to zero at this PN order. And the last example, um, well, not the last one, but another example is the quasi metric. So in the formal limit, D goes to minus one. So in this case, we can't use the physical spin chi tilde because uh, it just introduces terms that diverge everywhere. So instead we, we keep the original uh, spin parameter from the original stealth care solution we had at the beginning. So before rescaling and um, we get these expressions. So here it's kind of the opposite as the previous case. We have the short chilled uh, precession at leading order. We have the short chilled corrections, but we have no frame dragging in between. Okay. Um, and this is because actually in this limit, the physical spin, so the one that a person at infinity would measure, is zero. So someone looking from very far away at this would just think it's a it's not spinning. But uh, there is this quadruple term here which doesn't depend on the mass or, or I mean, importantly, A. It's, it's, not, uh, it's not uniquely determined. So it's like a free quadruple parameter, uh, which again is, is a violation of the no hair theorem. So generically, I mean, in all the cases, no hair theorem is violated. So if, if in a few years we, we see that the, the no hair theorem of GR is, is, uh, is uh, respected, then uh, all this is, uh, is ruled out. And now the, the last thing we, we were uh, interested in is um, we wanted to find the sort of maximum deformation parameter that we could use, okay? So uh, maybe you remember when I discussed the asymptotic expression of the disformed metric, uh, I said when one plus D becomes large, it seems to bring higher order terms to leading, uh, I mean, they just become larger, okay? Um, so we assume this, we assume that D plus one is uh, small, and by this, I mean that we single out one star uh, with semi-major axis A and assume that the deviation of D from minus one is given by this epsilon. So uh, an important thing to note is that this is not a function of R. So this is very dependent on the star you're considering at the moment. So we're considering one star. And for this star in particular, it will, uh, this choice of parameter will basically, it will seem like higher order PN corrections become of leading order, okay? Um, so in this case, we expect the Schwarzschild precession to be modified, and indeed we obtain this, right? So sorry, this uh, this uh, parameter is the pericentership, the, like the total pericentership. So the this variation plus the one coming from the rotation around the z-axis. So it's like the apparent pericentership, if you will. And in Schwarzschild, it's just this, and uh, in our case, we get this red correction. Now, if we apply this to uh, to S two with epsilon zero giving, given by this. It basically gives a bound, this is a bit rough, but basically it gives a bound on, on this uh, extra correction here. And um, if we want to maximize the effects of this formality, basically the, the smallest disformal parameter we can take that's still consistent with the um, S2 measurement is this, okay? So this is just pushing it as far as we can. Uh, basically the, the theory having the largest, this, the largest modification due to this formality. But now if we consider another star, which generically will have epsilon different from epsilon zero, I, I remind you epsilon is just the ratio of mass to semi-major axis. Um, if we take another star, the prediction for the total pericentrist is given by this. So if you apply this to a star 
to S2 or to a star having the same distance more or less as S2, you get the same prediction, which is com comparable to, uh, I mean, consistent with the current experiments. But with another star, you can you can actually get some sort of prediction um, for the for the measured pericenter. But this is only valid when uh, when the parameter epsilon respects certain bounds. This is due to the fact that this formal parameter has to be a constant. Okay, it's not just here; it's not a function of r. Otherwise, it would be much more general. But uh, our whole construction relies on a constant, this formal parameter. So there is this uh, this constraint on the parameter epsilon. Okay, so let me let me conclude. Okay, I think uh, I'm pretty much on time. Um, so care, alternatives to the care space time are very interesting to test GR, but also in their own right, I believe. Um, so we constructed solutions to those theories by performing this formal transformation, as I explained, along the this geodesic scalar. Um, now, while from very far away the black hole looks like care, uh, once you, you get closer, it presents some very non-trivial properties, which are very different from care, like very importantly, the non-circularity uh, property, which I discussed. Also the horizon profile, which is no longer R equals constant, which is no longer a killing horizon. Um, and this uh, sort of uh, region inside the stationary limit, which we don't really, um, I mean, we don't really know what happens there. Uh, I highlighted two particular simpler metrics, which uh, could be very useful in understanding some properties of non-circular space-times in the future. And uh, okay, then by calculating the PN motion of stars around deformed cow black holes, um, I showed that generically the no-hair theorem of GR is violated in, in all these examples. And in a particular uh, limit, we kind of isolated the, the maximum deformation that would be um, allowed given the current constraints by the gravity collaboration. So um, thank you. And if you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Thank you. Thank you for your talk. So I see that there are a couple of questions. So let's start with uh, Chen Yu Chen. Yes, thank you for the, for the talk. Uh, so in, in one slide, you show the equation for event horizon. Can you elaborate more on how you derived that equation in this general metric? Right. So, um, what you do in so what you do in general, say you're looking at care and you wonder what's the horizon, you assume that you you have the horizon at a constant r. So here you have r equals capital R, if you will. And what you do is you take the normal vector to the surface and look where its norm vanishes. And this generically brings you to the to the constraint uh, g r r equals zero with the components upstairs. Right. This is the usual thing, and it, it gives you this equation. Uh, and for care, as I mentioned, you're happy because the the solutions you get to this equation is compatible with your original hypothesis. So it's over. You found the horizons. Um, in our case, if you do the same thing, you, as I said, you have to. Oops, sorry. You have to solve this equation instead, meaning that um, the original hypothesis was wrong. Because if you're looking for constant R solutions, it means it has to be solution to this, and you find solutions that depend on theta. So it's just inconsistent. So from the beginning, you have to assume that the profile is theta dependent. And then you write the normal vector. So the covariant components of this vector is just going to be, I mean, 0, 1 minus the derivative of r here, 0. And you take the norm squared, which gives you this equation. So oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. OK, thanks. Hmm. Could, could I ask a question? Yeah, yes, sure. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, so uh, it's about your numbers and your example. You know, uh, if you wanted to use S two star to test gravity theory, so if you, I don't know your number for deformed metric, but for ordinary care. So if you wanted to evaluate spin or something like, let us say, uh, <clears throat> uh, upper center shift. So in this case, it has to be. Uh, or oh, pericenter is no matter. Uh, it is around 10 micro arc seconds. So it means it's very hard to expect. So observation of this phenomenon in the, in the future. And also you have, but you consider some generalization of care metric. It means your effect will be even smaller than simple, uh, let us say, uh, observation of spin, ordinary spin. In this case, I don't know, probably you 
past this uh, this this uh, this uh, let us say procedure but first probably you have to find some let us say signatures of uh, let us say deformation of ordinary Schwarzschild because in this case you see you have to, you probably there is a chance to find some signatures of let us say deformation but for care you see I tell you that is 10 micro second so that is but at the moment even gravity got even precession. They found only Einstein effect, no more. So, but also my suggestion, but I don't know, probably it's also reasonable to consider, you know, the Lares experiment uh, found some lensetheric precession. I mean, for, let us say, for satellites. Probably you could evaluate also, uh, let us say, uh, let us say, signatures of your theory for this experiment. That is some suggestion, but I will have a doubt that using care deformation of care metric, so uh, you could detect this uh, this this uh, let us say uh, signatures of this deformation because also you have to keep in mind, in addition to uh, care or generalization of care metric, you have unavoidable extended mass distribution due to presence for sure stellar cluster. There is a mass there. And uh, of course, there are different estimates of this mass, but it's unavoidable. You see, this extended distribution of mass could mask real, real metric of, uh, let us say, uh, compact object like black hole or generalization of, uh, of uh, let us say, care, something like this. Thank you. R right. Um... So I agree in the, in the general case, for the moment, the current observations don't really tell us anything about our space times. Uh, as I said, it's once the no hair theorem is, is, is violated or not, like when we have sufficient uh, experimental evidence for this, then it'll be enough to, to rule out. But um, in most of the examples, the short field precession uh, is, uh, I agree, very, is the same as GR. I mean, um, the leading, the current observations aren't able to, to constrain this. Apart from this uh, sort of maximal example that we we considered in the end, but um, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, we're not there yet. Yeah, and also, yeah, we didn't take. A, I mean, considered a very simple setup. We didn't uh, take into account these uh, extended mass distributions uh, as you were suggesting. For the for the satellites, however, I don't know. So we're talking about black holes, so I don't know why. Uh... Uh, you see, you said also about lens Turing effect. Yeah. yeah. In principle, yeah. there is a. So my suggestion is the following: there is a lens Turing effect in ordinary GR, but in principle, you have some correction of lens Turing effect, as a, if I understood you properly. Well, uh, no. So in, so uh, yeah, I mean, generically there isn't, but there are some particular cases where the term disappears, for instance. Yeah. Yes, you have some, some generalization. What about Laris? Because one of the best estimate for, there, is a, there are Lajos and Laris satellites. People evaluated uh, uh, of, uh, let us say, this phenomenon, lens tearing for these cases. But of course, there are significant differences, uh, difficulties. Uh, I mean, due to gravitational, let us say, Earth gravitational field. But people are dealing with these difficulties and they are saying that it's, it's more or less okay. But in this case, you could probably evaluate parameters of generalization of your theory for this case also, because you have all this expression in your hands, you know. Please, please, uh, uh, let us say, scheme this, this data. I mean, it's, you could find it in the internet easily. But it's one of the best estimate because you know there is a gravity prop B estimate of lens tearing and also Laris and Lajos. You know, the experimental yeah. evidences for uh, lens tearing for, for Sagittarius A star. No, no, for for Earth satellites. Yeah. No, yeah, exactly. But then, but then this doesn't apply, right? Because this is for a black hole. No, no, black hole, of course. But I mean, it's uh, there is. A, uh, lens tearing effect also for a complex object, you know, because it's of course you could, let us say, remove, uh, let us say, uh, higher harmonics for gravitational potential, but you could find re relativistic, um, let us say, effects not only for black holes, but also for, let us say, because deflection of light 
people discovered, uh, Eddington discovered this effect not for black hole, but for sun. I know, I, I know there's a lens steering effect associated to the sun. I'm just saying our, our objects describe a black hole, so it would be strange to apply it in the solar system, I feel. But maybe I'm not understanding something. Oh, okay, okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you, sorry. Um, I actually have a question. Uh, so can, can you repeat what you mean by um, known uh, circular space times? Right, so um, intuitively, it just means that you can't flip T and phi simultaneously. Yeah, you can't uh, isolate a coordinate system that verifies I, it's this. This property, sorry, no, I follow this. Uh, I, the, the name uh, I, 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 is this, okay, okay. Mm. And this has to do with the, sorry, maybe it's related question. So can you show what uh, is uh, the field uh, uh, profile that you use uh, to disform the metric? Uh, oops, here. Uh -huh. So does it does it have to do with the fact that there is T in this uh, in this field? Uh, yes, I guess because it, it, this generates. Um, so if you if you don't have T here, huh. you're just gonna add by the disformal transformation. You're just gonna add a GRR term. Uh -huh. So basically, this won't be here. The the fact that there's a cross term is because precisely there's both a time and spatial rate dependence here. Okay. Okay. So yeah, yeah, it's linked. Uh, Valery, uh, you have a question? I have a similar question to Alexander. Uh, yes. What happens if, you're con if you consider not black holes, but just compact objects, right? Suppose you have the same theory as yours, I mean, as the toss theory that is obtained by this disformal transformation. Now, what sort of uh, phenomena would you expect for compact, compact objects? You mean uh, why, applying, why? so sorry, you mean like applying a similar procedure starting from some other metric? And... No, no, I'm saying that you, uh, once you make the, the, this formal transformation of the, uh, of the original theory, whatever it is, you get some other, you know, toss theory, right? So this, this is a solution. This, this metric is a solution to a certain toss theory, right? Yes, exactly. So take the same toss theory and ask what is what what are the solutions for compact objects, not necessarily black holes. Mm. Yeah, we no, we haven't uh, we haven't we haven't really focused on the theories, honestly. Um, we basically just studied the side element from a phenomenological point of view more more, more precisely. I mean, um, well, we I mean, didn't far away from the from the uh, from the compact object. You really don't care if it is a black hole or. Uh, or a compact object, right? You have vacuum, yeah. vacuum metrics, so uh, um, uh, vacuum configuration anyway. So, uh, I mean. So, right, when you write these sorts of expansions, yeah, you, you don't know if it's a black hole. Yeah, you don't no. really care if you're, if you're no, sure. a compact object or, or. So, this means that the, the um, experiments in the solar system may be I mean, sort of more relevant than. Uh, uh, Sagittarius A. Mm. Yeah, we haven't considered other other objects. I mean, I think I see what, what you both mean now, but no, we haven't looked at this at all. Very good. Very good. If there are no other questions, so, so we thank uh, the speaker.